This morning we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, continuing to look at this title, Saved by Grace, this great passage there in Ephesians chapter 2. This morning we're specifically looking at verses 4 through 10. The choir just sang that song, Amazing Grace, my chains are gone. That's the cry of every follower of Christ who is here this morning. As we think upon the goodness of our God, as we think upon the amazing, marvelous, matchless grace that He has shown us, we cannot help but be overwhelmed by who He is and what He has done. I believe as we consider His grace and just this Grace has been a constant theme as we've walked through the book of Ephesians. As we look at the richness of His grace that He has lavished upon us. We don't just experience that kind of grace and keep it to ourselves. We don't just experience God's grace and just say, well, this is mine. I get to delight in it and not share it with others. In fact, we said last week that it's one of the reasons why we must have a relentless burden for the lost. That when we consider all that God has saved us from, we look at who we were before Christ, we come to the realization that those that are outside of God's grace, those that are lost, those that will one day uh, face the eternity in hell, apart from Christ, we must be faced with the realization that at one time that was true and that was the condition of each and every one of us. And so we must share. As we become overwhelmed with God's grace and we realize more clearly the immensity of God's grace in our own life, we tell others. And we share the gospel. In fact, this idea of grace and how it pertains to the gospel is central to the Great Commission. And I believe with all my heart that we will do the Great Commission most when we recognize just how needy we are and how gracious God is. My prayer, as I've said it before, one of the great dangers is that sometimes the longer we are part of the church, the longer that we have a relationship with Christ, if we're not careful, it can become just routine. We hear about grace all the time. And my great fear is that we will become a people who get over grace. May that never be so of us. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons why we have verses like this that we are looking at this week because it reminds us of what our life was like before grace entered the picture and then of what Christ has done through grace in our lives. Last week we looked at the reality that before grace we were miserably lost and the picture that it painted was not a very flattering picture. We said that it wasn't even that we were just spiritually ignorant or indifferent to the things of God, but that actually we were spiritually dead. We didn't even have the longing for the things of God or the capacity to long for the things of God because we were spiritually dead. And if that wasn't enough, we also said that we were dominated. And we looked at these two great enemies that were controlling us, that we were following. We talked about how we were dominated by the world and we were dominated by the devil, meaning that we were following their ways. We were surrendering to our culture, to the world, and ultimately even to the great enemy himself who had control over our lives. And this is the state of any person whose life is apart from Christ. They are dead. They are dominated. And then we talked about how also, apart from Christ, we were depraved in our flesh. That one of our great enemies is even within us that we, can't, we don't even long for the right things. That something within us desires the, what pleases the flesh and what desires fill the flesh. And yet they do not desire the things of God apart from Christ. We found there in verse 3 that not only apart from Christ were we dead 
in our trespasses and sins, but that also we were children of wrath. Children of wrath, meaning that God's anger as a righteous and holy God rested and remained and abided on us. John 3.36 says it this way, that he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides, remains, stays on him. So that's the bad news. That was the state of every individual here at one time apart from Christ. That's the state of billions around our world that do not know Christ. Some of which have never even heard the name of Jesus. And thus we must go. And we must tell them. So that's the bad news. But listen as we read the gloriously good news. Beginning in verse 4. It says, But God, be rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk. In death. Let's pray this morning. Father God, I am reminded constantly of my own inadequacy, my flaws of that flesh that still at times wants to well up and control me and drive me. And yet, God, you are the one that offers deliverance, you are the one that offers healing. You are the one that offers life amidst the dead. So God, we depend on you. Lord, as those that have been raised to life, God, I pray that you would continue to move us where you want us to go. That God, that you would continue to open our eyes and our hearts that we might See and behold wonderful things out of your law, God. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and that we as your people would listen and listen well. God, don't let these words today be my words or the words of just some preacher, God. Those aren't going to make a difference. They're not going to change a single heart or transform a single life. But Lord, your words are powerful. Your words are sufficient. Your words are sustaining. Your words are what we need. And so God, simply as we prayed and sang earlier, God, be welcomed here. Fill this place. Revive us. And use this time for the good of your kingdom. And for the advancement of your gospel. Lord, plant seeds within our heart even now that as we hear these words proclaimed and we experience and talk about the majestic grace that has been offered to us in Christ. God, that news is simply too good for us to keep it to ourselves. I pray even now, God, that you would plant people's lives and faces on our hearts, God, that as we're thinking and talking, that there will be people in our lives that we know don't know you, God. And I pray that right now you would plant a burden in our hearts that as we hear of this grace, we will not be able to rest until we go and tell others of the love that you have for them. God, we praise you above all. Be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If before grace we were miserably lost, then by grace we are going to see that you were 
mercifully saved. By grace, you were mercifully saved. What he says beginning in verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. As we begin here, I think something important for us to remember is that Scripture at its core is inherently God-centric, not me-centric. When we read the Bible, we are not the heroes of the Bible. God is. We are not the main character of the Bible. God is. And this does not mean that the Bible doesn't speak an enormous amount of truth for us and about us, but... The problem is that most of us, by nature, when we read Scripture, even hear Scripture, we approach it from a very me-centric approach, as if it's all about us. What is this saying to me, or about me, or for me? And if we do that consistently, we will inevitably miss the deeper meaning and the power behind what is being said in passages such as this here. The first thing he says here should take us back in light of all the death and depravity and sin and wickedness that is pictured in the first three verses describing our life before Christ. It all changes with those two little words that have been at the center of our conversation these last few weeks. But God. In reality, this transition is not so much a transition as it is the subject of this whole section. In the original Greek, there's no period after verse 3 like we find in our English translations, but instead, as Paul has been fond of doing so far here in the book of Ephesians, verses 1 through 7 in the Greek is one long sentence, with verses 1 through 3 serving as a, some form of introductory clause describing what's next to come. It's the introduction of the phrase, but God. And that phrase, but God, then transitions from the past reality of who we were before Christ to the present reality of the effects of grace on us in Christ. I actually, in a very nerdy moment, diagrammed this sentence. My ninth grade English teacher, Mr. Freeman, would have been so proud of me. And in diagramming this sentence, I found that the subject is God, and the main verb is has made us alive. What an incredible reality that we were dead, but God has made us alive. Amen? So why all the additional information in this verse? Why not just say that? It's as if Paul here wants us to know absolutely everything about this God who has made us alive. So the phrase, but God, is then followed by three prepositional phrases describing the majesty and wonder and greatness of this God. He gives us three descriptions of who this God is. The first thing he says is, but God being rich in mercy. He is the God who is rich in mercy. Do you ever feel the sting of your past or the weight of bad decisions that you have made? Do you ever wrestle with your failures of, and sins from yesterday that just keep creeping back into your life today? Maybe you've asked yourself before or even at this time, God, how could you ever forgive me? How could you keep coming and showing me grace and kindness over and over again? And it is because of this exact fact. The reason why God has moved such a wicked people. All of us are sinners. All of us have gone astray. All of us has turned to His own way. And the reason why God can save us, the reason why God can raise dead people to life, is because He is a God who is rich in mercy. Look at what Micah 7 verse 18 says. 
this life. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. Look at Psalms 103, verse 8. It says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. We see this incredible picture over and over again that He is the God who is rich in mercy, but it doesn't stop there. It also says that because of the great love with which He loved us, He is the God who is great in love. We're glad of that fact this morning. Do you ever feel unwanted or unloved? Or even worse, are there times in your life when you just don't feel or are not very lovely? I have those moments. I have those moments when I'm not very easy to love. You can ask my wife. Never mind, don't, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. I'm stubborn at times. I'm unreasonable at times. I get moody at times. To look at me like, amen. Stop it. <laughs> I saw her thinking it. I am abundantly thankful for God's love and God's goodness and God's grace. He is the God who is great in love. But it doesn't even stop there. Is also that we, or we read in Romans 5, verse 8. But God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There was nothing good in you to warrant God's grace. There was nothing that we did deserving it. God simply granted us this immeasurable, infinite, powerful, while we were still sinners, meaning while we were still dead and dominated by the world and the devil and depraved in our flesh, while all this was still true of us, Christ still went to the cross, knowing our flaws, knowing our sins. God, Christ still went to the cross in obedience to Father God and died for you and me that we could be saved. He has proven His great love time and time and time again. And then he says this, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he is the God that even death cannot stop. He is the God that nothing can hold back. And I'm thankful for that because I believe every single one of us struggle with this. Because our, our ultimate problem, as we've already seen, is not that we were just morally questionable. It was not that we were just ignorant of the things of God or indifferent to the things of God. The greatest problem that you and I have ever had in our life is that we are spiritually or were spiritually dead. And so we thank God that He is a God that even death cannot stop. He's the only God that can heal what is wrong with us. Let that weight of that statement sink into you that we were dead. Death stops everything typically. Death stops your heart from beating. Death stops your lungs from breathing. Death stops your body from moving forward. But death cannot stop our God. It's the reason why we can say what 1 Corinthians 15, 55-57 says. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see here, but God, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He has made us alive together with Christ. By
grace you have been saved. Now here's why that's such good news. It's such good news because it means that no matter how dark it gets, no matter what you may face, no matter what comes against you, God has never and will never abandon you. And church, I'm not just saying that. I know that. I've lived that. I've experienced God's goodness and His grace. I've experienced His presence in the midst of some of life's darkness and pain. And I can tell you that it is the greatest reality when we understand that our greatest need is not necessarily deliverance from life's pains, but it is God's presence in the midst of those pains. I can tell you with all confidence that He is the God who will never leave you nor forsake you, that never abandons you. I was reminded of this a few years ago. There was a documentary that came out called The Insanity of God. Maybe some of you have seen this documentary. But in it, it, they were interviewing a missionary family or missionary couple from who were serving in Somalia under brutal conditions. They've undergone some hardship and loss in their personal life. And they began asking some of those hard questions. And as part of this process, they began to go around and actually interview other missionaries and pastors. And one of the stories that he told in this process was of the pastor named Dimitri. He told the story of Dimitri. Now, Dimitri lived in the Soviet Union. And Dimitri didn't start out being a pastor. He didn't go to school to be a pastor. He wasn't seminary trained or anything like that. Dimitri was simply a factory worker who lived there in what is today Russia. Dimitri, what ultimately drove him to be a pastor was not any kind of sense of, you know, well, I'm called to be a pastor. It was simply the fact that he had two sons that he knew needed to hear the message of Jesus Christ. He knew they needed to be taught God's Word. And so in the afternoons each evening, he would begin to take the Bible and he would simply walk through the Scriptures with them. He would read the Bible to them and pray with them and they would discuss it and spend that time together. Well, pretty soon his sons began to invite their friends and Their friends began to invite their families until before long, Dimitri had 150 people meeting in his home to study God's Word each week. The reality is it's hard to hide 150 people coming to your house. And so it wasn't long before the KGB got word. And one day while Dimitri was teaching the Bible, they burst into his home and arrested him and transported him 600 miles away from his family to a Russian prison filled with 1,500 hardened criminals where he would spend the next 17 years of his life. Now, the hard part of this is that he could leave at any point. All he had to do was sign a confession that he was no longer a follower of Christ and that he would no longer teach in his name. And if he would simply sign this confession, he could go home and he could see his wife and he could see his children. But for 17 years, Dimitri sat there in that prison under absolutely brutal conditions. Now every morning, Dimitri would do the same thing. As he rose up, he would stand up in his jail cell and he would step to the gate And as he stood there, he would begin to sing what he called his heart song. And his heart song was just a a song of devotion to Christ that his father had taught him years ago about how God strengthens us and sustains us and watches over us. And so every morning, Dimitri would stand up in his jail cell and he would begin to sing this heart song. And whenever the prisoners would hear this song, whenever the other 1,500 inmates would hear this pastor began to sing these words to his God, they would become extremely violent. They would begin throwing things, and they would begin yelling and cursing and even spitting, trying to drown out the words of this man. And yet in the midst of this chaotic scene every day, here is Dimitri 
singing his heart out to his God. The prison guards wouldn't even give him a pencil and paper because they knew that all he would do would be to write down Scripture on it. And anytime he would find even the smallest scrap of paper, he would write down uh, Bible verses on it, and then he would stick it on the column there in his jail cell. And he would stick it as high as he could, and he would read them, and he would pray to his God, and he would sing to his God in worship. And when the guards found them, they would take them down, and they would rip them up, and they would beat him severely for it. That was just the physical attacks. The psychological attacks were even worse. Because not only did they try to break him physically, but they tried to break him mentally and emotionally and spiritually. After he'd been there about 15 years, and for 15 years they'd been trying to break this guy and get him to recount his faith or recant his faith and to, to, to turn from Christ, they did, they, what they did was they found a prostitute. And they dressed her in his wife's clothes. And while he is sitting there in his jail cell, they drug her past him screaming. And as they went downstairs with her screaming the entire time, they spent the next three hours beating and molesting her until finally three hours later they drug her lifeless body out in front of him. At that point, Dimitri's faith just couldn't take any more. He broke. And he looked at these guards and said, you draft whatever letter or document you, you, you want to. And in the morning, when you're finished drafting it, bring it to me and I'll sign it. So the next morning, they came back with this document. And Dimitri said, last night, my God gave me a dream. And in that dream, I could hear my wife and my sons praying for me. In my dream, I... God showed me and told me that they were still alive. And so I'm not signing anything. So they beat him again. A few years later, he's walking in the courtyard and he said it was like God had directly given this to him. He finds an entire sheet of paper and a pencil just sitting there on the ground in front of him in the courtyard. And so he takes it back to his room and he writes down every verse he could remember and he sticks it up on the column there in his jail cell. When the guards find it this time, they go insane with rage. They tear it down, they rip it up, they throw it in his face and they grab Dimitri and they say that they point out to the courtyard that he can see through a window. And they say, do you see that pole down there in that courtyard? In 15 minutes, you're going to be tied to that post. And in 20 minutes, you're going to be shot dead. We're done with this. And they begin to drag him towards the courtyard to be executed for his crimes. Well, as they're dragging him, the guards just stop. They just stop. And they let him go. And they listen. All of a sudden, 1,500 inmates begin standing at attention and they begin singing the very heart song that Dimitri has been singing for 17 years. And they're just dumbfounded. Not long after this, Dimitri's release. See, we never know. We don't always understand why God allows us to go through certain hardships. We don't always understand why we have to face the trials and things that we do. But in this, we can understand that our God will never leave us. He will never abandon us. He did not abandon us. When we were dead in our sins and our trespasses, He didn't abandon us then. And He will not abandon us now. Amen? Amen. That's a but God moment. As I said, my own life could testify to so many. I know yours could too. 
whether it's grief or loneliness or depression or despair, anxiety or fear, God has never made me walk those roads alone. He will not do so. Instead, He saved us and redeemed us. He moves us from death to life. And that's what we see in this verse, that God, but God, made us alive together with Christ. And then he's, then the, third, the, the final point of this that I want us to get here this morning is that not only is it by grace that we have been mercifully saved, but we're also going to see that because of grace, you will be majestically seated. Look at what it says in verse 6. That He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. First thing it says there is that He raised us up and seated us with Him in the heavenly places. Now, obviously, physically, we aren't seated in the heavenly places right now. You're here. But the picture being displayed here is that our resurrection is so intimately tied to Jesus that when Jesus walked out of that tomb on Easter morning all those years ago, it's like you and I walked out of the tomb with Him. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, the same power that has defeated death, and the same power that now raises us up and seats us with Him. And this idea is like a promise that we who have been saved, that God will seat us up with Him. And this is assured because God's Word says it is. And before we start getting the big head, looking at ourselves sitting on the thrones and with our crowns in heaven and all this glorious picture, I want you to notice something. All of this is for God's glory. It says that He seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. That word show actually means to display something. So it might read that God has made us alive. He has raised us up and now He has seated us with Him to put on full display for all of heaven to see His glorious and amazing and matchless grace. The imagery here is that you and I are the jewels of God's kingdom that demonstrate the greatness and immeasurable riches of His grace. This isn't a perfect picture, but it's kind of like this. All of us display things that reflect our greatest achievements. And so if you go over to my office on my wall, you're going to find my diplomas from my bachelor's and my master's degree. You're going to find my ordination certificate because those are things I'm proud of those of, of, of achievements that I have made. But you know what an even better picture is? It's not if you go to my office. It's if you go to my home. And you know what you're going to find on my walls if you go to my home? Not some diplomas or some certificate. You know what you're going to find on the walls of my home? Pictures of my children. Why? Because I love them. And every time I see their pictures, I'm reminded of my love for them. And at least to some extent, in some way, they reflect who I am. And I think that captures the idea of this verse. That God has put you on display. He's hung you on His wall, if you will. That the greatness and infinite glory and immeasurable riches of His grace towards us in Christ Jesus might be on full display for all to see. The very fact that God would save sinners like you and me doesn't point to anything in us. It's not in our doing in any way. And just in case we were to doubt that, he states clearly in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
You see, you don't get this grace by trying harder. You don't get this grace by working more. You don't even get this grace by coming down the aisle and signing a card or saying a prayer or any form of religious ritual that you might go through. You get this grace by surrendering your life and everything you are to Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us the truth of this when it says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. See, that's what we're each called to do. Is to look at God and say, Lord, here's my life. It's a blank check. I don't know if kids today still know what a check is. I may have to create a different illustration in the future. But it's to look at our life and say, God, here's a blank check. You fill it in. You do with it what you will. I want to be obedient to you. You see, when we do that, when we become that obedient, when we become that surrendered, Christ, that's when your life and your story becomes the masterpiece, the workmanship that he's talking about in verse 10. For he says that, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, here's the reality. So you aren't saved by your works but you are created for good works. Meaning that as we serve Him, it's not out of obligation. We're not obligated, like if we don't check these boxes and do these tasks, then you're not going to be saved. It's not out of obligation that we serve, but you have been created in such a way so that when you understand the depths of grace that you have experienced in Christ, when you experience His goodness and His love time and time again, you will want to serve and work for His kingdom out of a sheer sense of devotion and love for Him who first loved you. We aren't saved by our works, but we were created for good works according to what verse 10 tells us. But that's what we do. We were dead. But in Christ, we've been made alive. And we've been raised up. So that as we live for Him, all of heaven and all of earth may see the effects of God's grace on what once was dead. is now alive and living in passionate obedience to the King. What an incredible picture. What a mighty 